Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to our guests, Don and in from the US. Um, thank you all for taking the time out to attend our webinar today. And I hope wherever we are in the world that you are keeping well and safe amidst the current state of the pandemic. <clears throat> So my name is Ronan Phelan and I'm an account manager with Island Networks. I see a few familiar names on the attendee list and I also see some new ones, which is great to see. So for those of you that don't know who Island Networks are, we're a specialist system integrator and we specialize in infrastructure, security and cloud services. We were founded in 2013 in Dublin. And since then, we've set up an office in the US in 2015 and in Singapore in 2020. Since we formed, <coughs> excuse me, we've been recognized by many of our partners with awards for our contribution to their increase in market share and customer satisfaction. Can you tip on to the next slide, please, Sean? Perfect. So before I hand you over to Sampras, I'd like to give you a broad overview on cybersecurity as it is today. I was doing some research and came across uh, some interesting stats. So COVID-19 has led to a huge spike in cybercrime, largely due to mass uh, remote working. And this has contributed largely to the worldwide information security market been forecasted to reach 170 billion in 2022. So you can see that's a phenomenal amount of money being spent to keep the bad guys out. <clears throat> in 2020, 80%, sorry, 86% of data breaches were financially motivated and 10% were motivated by espionage. So if an attacker's not after your money, they're after your data or intellectual property. And speaking of money, the average cost of a data breach rose 30% over the last five years, up to almost $4 million. Now that's just an average figure. A payout from a cyber attack could range anywhere from 10K to 400 million. And the top um, malicious email attachment types are that .doc and then .exe. Now I have to hold up my hand and say, <laughs> I have opened many .docs from unknown sources. So quite a scary figure. And currently, 90% of the world's enterprise organizations use Active Directory as their primary method for authentication and authorization. And Microsoft tells us that 95 million AD accounts are the targets of cyber attacks every single day. So as you can see, attacks are becoming more prevalent and more, sophist <coughs> more sophisticated, excuse me. So what can we do? Well, we, continue, we can continue to defend against the onslaught of cyber attacks by building multi-layer security barriers so firewalls, endpoint protection, IPS, IDS systems, and so on. And to add to this, we can further protect Active Directory, and more importantly, recover Active Directory if it becomes compromised. So I'm gonna hand you over to Sempris, who will give you an overview on how their solutions can help you solve the problems that exist between cybercrime and Active Directory. Our speaker from Sempris has over 30 years experience in enterprise IT and hybrid identity. His experience as an identity strategy consultant for many Fortune 500 companies gives him a broad perspective on the challenges of today's identity-centered security. He's also an industry journalism veteran. As former technical director for Windows IT Pro, he has over 400 published articles on Active Directory, Azure Active Directory, and related security on Windows Server. So please welcome Sean Doobie. Thank you, Ronan, appreciate it. Uh, I am not wearing a tie today in uh, in honor of the fact that we're all working from home, although uh, you'd probably have to threaten me again with my life uh, to put have me put a tie on nowadays. So uh, yeah, so a lot more casual. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, essentially, I've been doing Microsoft for a long time. I've been doing Microsoft identity about as long as Microsoft has been doing Microsoft identity. So um, yeah, so this is all about the perspective around where Active Directory is today, the threats that it faces, and how, how things have changed for Active Directory since it first came out. I think it's a given, uh, I think most people recognize that Active Directory is really at the heart of your hybrid enterprise, and that if you haven't fully protected Active Directory, your organization is vulnerable to malware attacks like we're seeing on a regular basis. But what I'm here to tell you is that Active Directory may not be as protected as you think it is protected because of the way Active Directory works and the way the cyber landscape has changed for attacks to it. So what I'm gonna do is give you sort of a, um, uh, a framework, uh, pose a few questions to, to point out where Active Directory stands and what the vulnerabilities are. So first off, 
a few statements that I think make sense when you add them up. First is that identity is now central to modern security. When I first started going to identity conferences, there were a couple hundred people there and identity was just off in a corner, you know, in a security conference. What has happened is that in this cloud and on-premises world we are now all work in, it's become identity as the determining factor whether someone is secure or not. I mean, it's the idea behind zero trust. Microsoft says identity is the new control plane. Google says modernizing security by fully embracing zero trust models is an imperative, not an option. By the way, I just saw news yesterday that they're beyond corp zero trust framework as they've just announced as a beyond corp enterprise. Uh, so that's continuing to expand. Okta says uh, identity is mission critical. Gartner says identity is central to providing appropriate, accurate, and secure access. And finally, Forrester says identity is a core building block of a robust zero trust security ecosystem. The second is that hybrid is the dominant identity architecture. Of course, any organization that's been around for more than a few years, despite all the hype about cloud, has a significant on-premises or a majority on-premises IT footprint. Now, what has happened in the last five years is that about is that 70% today of Fortune 500 companies and the Fortune 1000 around the world have a Microsoft 365 subscription. They're using Office 365, I'm sorry, Microsoft 365 or other aspects of the Microsoft Cloud Services, Azure. So what that means is to get single sign-on and secure sign-on using your corporate credentials into Microsoft 365 or Azure or indeed Okta or uh, Google Cloud or Amazon uh, Web Services, you have to project your on-premises identities into that cloud service, which is done with a variety of technologies. Um, and what that does is it gives you secure single sign-on into these cloud services. But the reality is Active Directory is this year, it's now 21 years old. In the US, it would be old enough to drink. And in IT years, that's a long time, that's forever. And the fact that it has stood the test of time as well as it has is a fantastic testament to the designers of this identity system. But the reality is they could not have envisioned what the world looks like today with both cloud services and the attacks against identity systems that we're experiencing today. Indeed, Though the, the mind share is on cloud identity and is on cloud services, SaaS services, as I said, Microsoft, AWS, Google, um, Salesforce, you know, you name the big, the big systems. Active Directory remains the basis for the, this hybrid identity so that it's arguably more important than it has ever been, not less important than it has ever been. And at the same time, it is more vulnerable. So based on that, it is not a stretch to say that Active Directory is central to modern security. All of your, all of this complicated hybrid enterprise that we have now, both on-premises and in the cloud, Active Directory is one of the foundational, if not the foundation to security. Now, as I said, at the same time, it is now a, significant cybercrime target for a number of reasons. This is a, uh, a risk matrix. If you work in risk assessment and risk mitigation, a risk, you know, you'll recognize this. If you don't, it's pretty straightforward. And a risk matrix, the x-axis is what is the impact of a threat? And the y-axis is what is the probability of that threat uh, occurring? And this is a traditional um, disaster recovery, uh, data center disaster recovery type threat matrix. And you can see the stuff in the upper right-hand corner, the red stuff, that's where you throw the money at first. And then if you have leftover, you work on mitigating the lower 
impact uh, threats. So power failure, natural disasters like hurricanes or tornadoes or earthquakes, uh, perhaps network issues, your mileage may vary on what you come up with in this risk matrix. But this is why every data center has uh, diesel generators and batteries outside of it because the, I, the risk of a power failure is pretty probable and the impact of it, of course, would be very high. So that's what you protect against. As I've said though, the threat landscape has changed for IT and information technology more, more broadly. And what I classify this as I call it denial of availability malware. People talk about ransomware all the time. Uh, there's really, there's ransomware, there's distributed denial of service, which I'm not going to talk about. And there is wiperware, which I am going to talk about. So this is just a, uh, a brief summary. We all know, we read in, now read in the news every day, what is, the, what is the attack du jour? What is the attack of the day? Uh, you can see we've got Hackney Council, we've got CMA, Newcastle University, Northumbria. Um, the list keeps on going. I'm, I am personally, I'm in uh, North Texas. So uh, last, uh, well, it was actually two summers ago when 20 agencies across the state of Texas were attacked by ransomware. You know, and, and as I say, the hits keep on coming on a regular basis. So what happens is this risk matrix changes. So instead of having the, what I think of as the geographically focused disasters and a network outage was counted as that because that's geographic. So is a hurricane or a tornado uh, or any other kind of a bad storm or an earthquake that's network centric. I mean, sorry, <laughs> that is geographically centric. Instead you have a cyber disaster which is a network centric disaster because the landscape of that is not physical. If you've got a data center in London and you've got a data center in Limerick, then if you have, you know, a, a bad North Atlantic storm hits, hits, you know, gets into to Limerick, then that's one thing, but London is not affected and you've protected against that. But if you have a cyber attack and those two data centers are on the same network, as far as the cyber attack is concerned, it's all one location. So this is a network-based attack in terms of disaster recovery and how you have to protect against it. So denial of availability malware is up there at the top and then pushes the other ones down uh, as far as what has to be done about it. Now, in terms of Active Directory, 97% of organizations in a survey that we did of about 200 companies say that Active Directory is mission critical to their business. You probably heard of AD being the keys to the kingdom. Well, AD is not only the keys to the kingdom, AD is also the treasure map to the data because anyone that is, has a domain account in an Active Directory domain or an Active Directory forest can poke around and look for things and find uh, applications. They can find databases. That's what AD is designed to do. It was designed in an era when there weren't attackers getting on the network and trying to use AD to find stuff. Well, that's one way, it's a treasure map. AD also can provide the pathway to spread the malware. There are a number of ways AD can do that, one of which is group policy. Group policy can, can be used for good to pass configuration changes to the members of an Active Directory forest, or it can be used for evil. 57% of the organizations that we surveyed said that an, an AD outage would have severe or catastrophic impact. So in the catastrophic aspect of it, I'm going to talk a little bit about Maersk. Um, so Maersk is the world's largest shipping company. If you've been on the roads for very long, you may have seen a Maersk shipping container. I remember for many years seeing that and wondering what on earth it was. Well, it turns out that one fifth of the world's shipping goes on the Maersk, uh, under the Maersk line and, and, and travels around the world. So Maersk in 2017 was hit by 
as collateral damage in an ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. So we have seen the in the news the what people call the kinetic war, the actual you know traditional warfare between Russia and Ukraine. And what is not quite so well known is that Russia also has been using Ukraine as a test bed for its cyber weapons. So it conducts cyber warfare against Ukraine. And um, the journalist, the wired journalist, his name is Andy Greenberg, has written a number of articles that goes into detail about the cyber warfare that Russia has been doing, uh, causing, um, causing power facilities to go offline, causing blackouts, um, a number of things used for both damage to physical infrastructure and for psychological impact to the people of Ukraine. One of the attacks that they did, probably the, the best known attack that they did was in uh, the spring of 2017. They created a weapon called NotPetya, a cyber weapon. It masquerades as ransomware. When an, a computer is hit by NotPetya, it looks, you get a logo, uh, you get a, a message that appears as though you've been hit by ransomware. Well, what it really is is wiperware. It is ransomware that encrypts a computer, but there's no decryption key. So it essentially destroys the data on the computer. There's no way to recover it. So this was designed to infect, they, des they pointed it at Ukraine, uh, but because it was so effective, it not only hit Ukraine, it hit a lot of companies around the world. What happened in Ukraine and what happened in particular to Maersk is this. Maersk uh, does business in Ukraine on the Black Sea and they have an office in Odessa on the Black Sea. And if you, of course, if you do business in Ukraine, you have to pay taxes in Ukraine. And Ukraine has a, a, a tax software um, that is called MEDOC. And it's like the most common tax software used throughout the company. So it's widely spread. It's on financial in financial accounting departments for companies all throughout Ukraine. And this is a predecessor of what has happened with the solar winds attack uh, in the US and other locations. So this is what's a, a, this is a supply chain attack. This is how the Russians figured out this. This was executed by this group called Sandworm, which is part of the GRU, the Russian military, which is a sister or brother organization to the Russian group that executed solar winds. So what they did was they took the NotPetya package and they uh, infected the MEDOC update servers so that when across Ukraine, the hundreds of computers that request a software update from MEDOCs downloaded NotPetya to their computers. And of course, what NotPetya did is it uses a combination of, it uses two zero day exploits and it uses Mimikatz, which is an active directory attack tool to immediately spread throughout the network and infect and encrypt computers around the network. So what happened with Maersk is one financial services computer, one, one account computer controlled, uh, uh, asked for an update and it received NotPetya, it infected that computer and within seven minutes, it destroyed 55,000 devices across the Maersk worldwide network. Andy Greenberg did a story for us. He did a, a presentation for our HIP conferences. And he told this story because he interviewed people that it, were at the Maersk headquarters um, in um, Denmark when this happened. And he said, people that were there saw a wave of black uh, screens go across the open work areas as this software encrypted everything in sight. People were running into conference rooms, slamming, uh, slamming lids on uh, uh, notebooks to keep them from getting infected, jumping over turnstiles to get to the computer room. And the, the turnstiles were frozen because they relied on Active Directory. So 
corrupted their environment. The Their shipping terminals, they have 79 shipping terminals around the world, like the one you see in this picture here. This particular shipping terminal is outside of Brooklyn, New York, and it is about one square mile in size. And the shipping containers, the size of the Empire State Building, pull up and unload and are loaded as part of their regular process. So when they were hit by NotPetya, it froze everything. The shipping, the shipping containers, or rather the container ships, did not know what was on them to be unloaded. They had a line of trucks outside their terminals around the world backing up because there was no way to tell what was in the containers because the computer systems were down. It was massively disruptive. The, the ports in the water and the harbors outside of there started backing up with uh, container ships. In the IT part of it, 146 of 147 of their Active Directory domain controllers were destroyed. The only reason that one AD domain controller was still available was because it was in a branch office in Ghana, Africa. And that branch office had had a power failure. So the DC was offline and was not available to be infected when everything else got infected. So IT called all around the world desperately looking for an AD domain controller that was still available. They finally found this one. They, of course, they said, don't bring it back online. And they had the IT admin extract the hard drives, take the, take the hard drives 250 miles from Accra, Ghana to Lagos, Nigeria, where he handed it to another IT person that happened to have um, a visa to be able to get into England. And he, this IT admin got a, a free ride in uh, Maersk's Gulfstream G450 jet from Lagos up to um, Gatwick Airport. And then from there to IT headquarters, carrying essentially the future of the company in his hands. Because if Active Directory had been lost completely and their backups were encrypted as well, if AD had been lost completely, they would have had to rebuild their network from scratch. And there's no telling how that would have, how that would have, how long that would have taken. So they brought that back there from that one set of drives. They were able to reconstruct, reconstruct Active Directory over the course of nine days. And the first domain control they brought back up on their seed force was on a Service Pro 4. The CIO slept at the office for 70 days. They bought every computer you could buy in the London area to try to bring back the Maersk systems. They estimated that they lost $350 million as a result of the, of the NotPetya attack. I'm sure that's, low, that's a low amount. And it also doesn't talk about the collateral damage to all of their suppliers that had all, the, all the, the stuff that they were trying to ship that didn't go where it needed to, that maybe spoiled or who knows what happened. Worldwide, the US State Department estimated that not, the not Petya losses were over $10 billion from one cyber weapon. The point being that an infection travels across a network as fast as the network works and as fast as Active Directory works. Now, of course, you can't talk about ransomware without talking about cyber insurance. And we actually had uh, an, a, an, an expert in this kind of a recovery on our, in our HIP conference. And you can actually see our, a panel where we talked about this. So she knows about this. She was a lawyer and she's done a lot of work with uh, insurance recovery and, and the, the, the short aspects of it. So what she says is that insurance companies, and this is not rocket science to understand this, insurance companies are incented not to pay. So they look for all the loopholes they, they can find. They look for the exclusions. Um, for example, NotPetya wasn't covered because they listed it as an act of war. These companies that were uh, affected by NotPetya, and by the way, um, not Maersk, but Merck Pharmaceuticals, was much lower key in talking about their not Petya damage, $900 million. Uh, they weren't, the insurance companies didn't cover it. 
what she said is if you're large enough to lawyer up, you have a better chance to get your claims across. But smaller companies definitely have a, a tougher track record to make that happen. 68% of companies encountered another sophisticated intrusion attempt within 12 months. So if you've been a victim once, uh, regardless of insurance, um, you are, there's a much higher chance that you will be hit again. And uh, in the US at least, you know, companies can be fined for paying ransomware to groups that are, are on restricted lists. In our survey, and this is the thing about Active Directory, it has an Achilles heel, and this is not so widely known, that a catastrophic failure where all domain controllers are affected is a different situation to recover from than what you traditionally see. Traditionally, AD, people always think about Active Directory, well, it's, it's bulletproof, it always comes back. It comes back against those geographic attacks against a network attack that can encrypt all of your Active Directory, it's a different story. And not many people realize that. 37% of organizations <coughs> understand the complexity of forest recovery. And I'm gonna give you just a little bit of an insight into how bad that is. More than 50% have never tested their Active Directory disaster recovery process, or they don't even have one. I think that's very, very important to point out. More than half of the companies out there don't have an active directory recovery, disaster recovery process, or they have never tested it, or they haven't tested it for years. Because historically, you really haven't needed it. But that was before the landscape changed, and we have these cyber attacks that can encrypt everything, like, uh, like Sandworm did to Maersk. So here's just a couple of slides to very briefly give you an idea of what it really looks like to have this situation happen. He, these are the questions that you have to have answered before you encounter that your, all of your domain controllers have been encrypted. And you have to have these down and you have to have procedures related to this because when AD is down, and I'm sure you think about this, your business is probably down. It's not a good time and it is not a low stress time to get have rational answers figured out. These are the actual steps required to, to perform an active directory forest recovery. And these 28 steps, if you go to the Microsoft website and you actually print out the forest recovery process on a PDF, comes out to like 96 pages. And the point is you can't just follow them step by step. You have to have this customized to your whole environment. For every domain that you have, you have to execute this sort of thing in parallel. And these are all the steps that take time. And sometimes these are steps that you can't do anything about. You have to sit there and twiddle your thumbs and wait for AD to do what it does and you can't hurry it up. Same thing over here. For every domain, for every domain controller your Active Directory service has, you have to go through all of this. And again, you can't do anything until you're through it. And finally, it's important to point out that this process, if you have multiple data centers and multiple locations, this becomes a process like provisioning an army because you have different sets of people have to execute certain things at different in different times and they can't do them out of order or you will have to start all over again. So where does Semperus fit in all of this? I'll spend just a few slides to give you just an overview of our company and give you an overview of how we address these issues that I've been pointing out. Semperus is, uh, the, the company name is short for Semper Paratus, which is the Latin for always ready. We provide next generation hybrid identity protection, like we've talked about, and cyber resilience against Active Directory uh, and soon uh, Azure Active Directory. We protect over 40 million Active Directory identities globally today already. We're a Microsoft Gold partner, we're Gartner endorsed. We hold uh, a, an annual conference called the HIP Conference, Hybrid Identity Protection Conference, and I also host a hybrid identity protection podcast where I interview 
uh, leading identity security professionals, and we talk about where what's going on in identity, best practices, and other good tips. We won a, a nice collection of awards over the last few years, um, and we have a top-notch, and I mean top-notch, group of individuals that are active directory experts of many, many years. I'm a Microsoft MVP of 15 years. Um, we have 16 year MVT, 14 year MVPs, uh, many, many years of experience in this area. To give you a sort of a framework to, of where our products fit, uh, this is in the US, this is the, the NIST and the, National Inst in, in the National Institute for Standards and Technology, the cybersecurity framework where you think about where you position cybersecurity products in this framework. So you need to identify the risk before an attack. You need to protect the services. You need to detect attacks. You need to respond to the attacks. And then you need to recover from the attacks. Semperus products <clears throat> protect Active Directory around this entire framework. So before an attack, we have the ability to do vulnerability assessments of your Active Directory, looking for indicators of exposure and indicators of compromise before an attack ever happens so that you have a way of looking at the security posture of your Active Directory and the ability to tighten it up, provide suggestions, look for uh, looking for attack vectors to beef up Active Directory before an attack ever happens. That is Directory Services Protector. This, will, this provides Active Directory with a vulnerability assessment, with tamper-proof tracking, which I'll talk about in a second, real-time alerts if it sees something unusual in an environment, the, in the environment, the ability to automatically remediate uh, an issue in Active Directory. For example, if somebody is added to domain admins, uh, the domain admins group, which is a highly privileged group, without authorization, uh, DSP can automatically roll it back and notify your SIEM system, send email messages and that sort of thing, and a, and a wide variety of compliance reports. <clears throat> this is an example of some of the indicators that we look for in DSP against Active Directory for changes in group policy. You can see informational alerts in blue. You can see in uh, yellow, you can see warnings like the built-in administrator account, which is usually locked down, has been used for something. And at the bottom, you can see a critical alert saying that <clears throat> the Mimikatz DC shadow attack has been executed in your environment. We have the ability to see this uh, very, um, very uh, powerful uh, backdoor attack into Active Directory. Other products can see the Mimikatz DC shadow attack has been executed, but we can actually show you the back door that has been inserted into Active Directory and roll it back. During an attack, we have, as I was saying, we have we can show the threat detection and the auto remediation. This is a list of all the changes that have been, that have happened in Active Directory. We tap into the stream of changes that Active Directory itself sees. So we know that it can't be tampered with. We see not just event logs, but we see the actual changes in Active Directory and we can roll back any changes that have been made that, uh, and that attackers may, make, may try to make. We can see it and we can help you protect you against it. And then finally, in the recovery aspect of it, we have cyber first disaster recovery process with our Active Directory forced recovery product. You've seen how difficult and how rarely done an Active Directory forest recovery process is because it's the manual process is so extremely difficult. Our highly automated, highly parallelized forest recovery product allows you to have about a 90% reduction in time over a manual forest recovery if you have ever even executed it successfully. We can recover Active Directory automatically. We can recover it without restoring operating system resident malware. Remember, if you've been attacked by malware, you know the resident dwell time for 
malware is around 200 days before it is triggered. So if you try to recover Active Directory from traditional backups, you will find that like a system state backup or a bare metal recovery, that you've probably restored the malware with it. Well, Active Directory Forest Recovery only backs up the Active Directory service itself. And in the case of a malware attack, what you do is you stand up a fresh virtual machine or a physical machine that you know has no malware on it. And you point the Active Directory, uh, the ADFR recovery to that new virtual machine and you recover Active Directory without the malware installed on it. This also, as I was just implying, we have the ability to recover to any other kind of virtual machine or physical machine. Instead of being tied to the same machine or the same VM that was backed up because we don't have the operating system, we can go someplace else. So if your on-premises virtualization environment has been laid waste, you can stand up new virtual machines in Azure or in AWS or in Google Cloud. And all you have to do is point to the IP address of those virtual machines and we can recover Active Directory just as easily to those virtual machines and get you back up and working. The process, the process is very simple. <clears throat> you can see we have literally three buttons that you can use to, discover, to, to recover a single domain controller or a partition or a forest. You can recover an entire Active Directory forest with six clicks and then spend the time to help uh, talk to the business, talk to management while this forced recovery happens in a fully automated process. As I said, we won a bunch of awards. We just learned recently that uh, Semperis is number 35 on the technology fast 500 uh, for Deloitte, the fastest growing companies in North America. <clears throat> you can see we've won a number of other awards and the largest companies in the, in the world uh, depend on us to protect their Active Directory. So my call to action for you is to, number one, look at your disaster recovery, your cyber disaster recovery preparedness for Active Directory. Are you prepared in, to do a full forest recovery if you have a Maersk type situation? What is your risk of malware reinfection when you're doing that kind of a recovery? And do you have flexibility in your recovery scenarios? Can you recover from on-premises into the cloud or from physical to virtual or even virtual to physical? And then on an ongoing operational ba basis, review your ability to protect and remediate Active Directory. Look for indicators of exposure in your AD environment. The ability to do activity review. So look for backdoor creation if you see for example, uh, a, a Mimikatz, uh, if you see a DC shadow attack, to be able to go find where the bad guy has injected that back door and pull it out. Uh, and the ability, both from an attack point of view and from a day-to-day -day administrative point of view, the oops point of view, the ability to roll back unauthorized change, either manually or automatically. Finally, uh, Andy Powell, who is the Maersk Chief Information Security Officer has said essentially that organizations must direct more IT resources into system recovery because high level nation state cyber weapons will take out everything you have online. Now we've seen this in SolarWinds, which was technically espionage, not cyber war, but you see the sophistication with which uh, companies are infiltrated nowadays. And it's it is incomplete to focus on just the prevention uh, and not be thinking about the recovery. And finally, every company should aspire to have Active Directory up and running within 24 hours. Nine days is too long, and they know from firsthand experience. So thanks for your time. Hopefully uh, you find found some of this interesting. I'm happy to chat and talk about questions. This is this is what I do, and I've been around this for many, many years, uh, and I find it very interesting. Thanks, Dan, or Sean, sorry. Uh, that was uh, very, very interesting. I think it's fair to say that the, 
The MERS story uh, is a story that keeps IT security personnel awake at night from falling asleep and having the net pet to the nightmare, like, you know, so um, um, just how quick that spread and, and how it impacted um, how it impacted that business. And as you said, what, what were the knock-on consequences of that? What were the containers that couldn't have been delivered? Like, you know, it's the consequential loss can never be determined. Um, I was also interested, as you said, at the beginning, identity has gone from, you know, being in the corner of events to becoming the mainstream and, and, and the centerpiece, like so. Um, we do have a couple of quick questions, uh, just some of the common questions that, that have been asked in the past, uh, if you can uh, just shed some light on. So you mentioned about the ADFR um, storing backups. Um, so can they be stored locally on domain controllers? And, and if so, like how many, how far back can we go with, with, with backups? Mm. Right, and I, I touched on this briefly, but in, um, I did not, didn't go deeply into it, is there are uh, ADFR functions in some ways similar to a conventional backup and recovery solution. You have to determine how often you want to back up your domain controllers and what domain controllers you want to back up and all that. But some things are significantly different so that we can provide this cyber disaster recovery. By default, <clears throat> when we back up a domain controller, one backup sits on the domain controller so that if you have uh, a situation and we broadly classify recovering Active Directory in two, two categories. One is where you trust the operating system. In other words, something's gone sideways with the Active Directory service on that domain controller and you need to just clean it out and restart it, which is the sort of the traditional scenario where AD is very reliable. So for that case, we keep a copy of the backup locally on that domain controller. And via an automated method, we can basically pull off AD and reinstall it on that domain controller and use the copy of that local backup that's sitting on that DC. Now, if this is the type of scenario, the ransomware or malware scenario where you don't trust the operating system, then you know, you're not going to count on that copy of the backup that is on the local DC because you never don't really trust the operating system that it's running on anymore. So we keep backups either on the management server. We also have a concept called distribution points for larger environments, which is sort of like a file server for Active Directory. And then if we are to recover that domain controller, the management server talks to the agent and shuts it down and reboots it in directory service recovery mode, gets the backup from a distribution point and applies the backup and brings it back up. All automatically, all you have to do is push a button and say what you want to have done and what backup you want to have restored. So that's a long-winded way of saying <laughs> there is one, uh, there is one, um, one copy locally, but the rest of the copies are all kept off of the domain controller for safekeeping. Perfect. And in terms of the restores that you just mentioned, um, so if, if an environment is compromised and we want to restore like from uh, a different environment, different hardware, is, is, is that achievable? Yes, so this is, um, this is what we call a restore to alternate IP address. This is the scenario where you don't trust the operating system. It's that second of the two cases. And you want to restore Active Directory to some place where you know it's safe. So you, in a virtualized environment, you use a virtual machine template that you know doesn't have any malware on it and you stand up a new virtual machine. It doesn't have to have Active Directory on it. The only requirement is that it's the same major OS version as the backed up domain controller. So if your DCs are all um, Windows Server 2016, you stand up a Windows Server 2016 virtual machine you point ADFR at that new IP address. You say, I want to recover this, um, this domain controller that was called Limerick DC1. And you stand up a new virtual machine. It could be called, it could be called VM1. Doesn't make any difference. You point the recovery at it. ADFR will install the Active Directory uh, binaries it will restore Active Directory, it will rename the machine, it will configure DNS, all of that, and boom, that becomes Limerick DC1 uh, up in the cloud. All, automa all automated, all very quickly, 
and you're you're back up and running again. And you, you mentioned, and I wanted to mention something that is a very popular side effect of this ability to do very easy forest recovery. Number one, it gives you the ability to do disaster recovery testing very, very easily. Disaster recovery testing Active Directory is very hard. You have to, I won't bore you with the steps that are necessary, but it is not simple. So it doesn't happen very often. With ADFR, the process becomes very, very simple because you have these hardware independent backups of AD. So you create an isolated environment, either a disaster recovery environment, or if you want to have a test or a development environment, you use ADFR to restore Active Directory into that environment. ADFR has the ability, let's say your production environment has 50 domain controllers or 100 domain controllers. ADFR will automatically, if you just have two or three domain controllers, it'll automatically cut down AD and do all the cleanup necessary to stand up Active Directory in a very small isolated environment. That's perfect for either disaster recovery testing or ongoing development testing. So this has been very popular because it's enabled testing scenarios that is, have typically been out of reach for AD uh, and other groups. So, so it's, it's like uh, from a high level overview, the essential things we need, number one is our backup if you become compromised. And then number two is somewhere to restore it with just the same operating system. It doesn't matter about the, the underlying hardware, et cetera. It just if it was 2016 and the previous, once we have 2016, on the, what we're restoring to, couple of mouse clicks, and then the process begins. That's right. And what we recommend is what I call a belt and suspenders approach, right? So the 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 normal configuration is you have act, you have an ADFR server on your production network, and it's handling all of this. But on a regular basis, you take a set of backups, and you take the backup metadata, and you take the configuration data for ADFR, and you store it offline someplace. You completely disconnect it from the network, or you use what, what is called worm storage, uh, write once, read many, that is protected against being corrupted or being changed. And you take it and you, and you keep it completely offline. So if you should unfortunately find yourself in a scorched earth scenario like not Petcha that I described, all you have to do is create your network, take this, take this, uh, take these backups, take this uh, configuration data of the ADFR server. You can recreate the ADFR server in a matter of 30 minutes. And then you have the backups pointed to the new virtual machines that you've created and boom, have AD backup again, even though your main, your main network has been scorched. Um, I'm gonna ask you a bit of a bold question. Um, the Maersk disaster. Okay, it took a long time to recover. On your experience with Sampras, what, how quick could you guys have got that back? Well, you know, certainly nine days is uh, uh, nine days is a long time, and uh, I have more stories on that that time doesn't allow us to to really get into. That is is even they're even more hair raising as you get into the logistics of having to do that. What we have seen. Uh, Empirically, what we have seen in organizations, and I'm not allowed to talk about actual Courts. You know, uh, incidents, is about a 90% reduction in time. Okay. So days to hours uh, in environments that have you know, a few thousand users, literally you know, less than an hour, depending on, you know, obviously there's a lot of variables. Uh, but uh, given the, given an adequate hardware, given adequate bandwidth, it can be done within an hour or two. So the larger environments, still hours, but multiple hours are the largest environment we protect has almost 600 domain controllers. Um, I can't speak to the uh, disaster recovery tests of, of an environment of that scale, but what we are seeing through our customers is as, as they do their as they do their tests in these very thorough disaster recovery tests, about a 90% reduction in time. Okay, so quite significant. Is well, and this is at, at a home. And it's, I'm just, you know, it's important to point out this is at a time when every minute, 
cost thousands oh yeah of course thousands of dollars yeah 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 of course i was just going to say the cio would have got home a lot earlier um <laughs> yeah yeah not a good um not a not a good day not a good week not a good yeah. Um, so look, that was a couple of questions on 84. Just just one quick question, a common question on DSP, uh, just in relation to the to the rollback process. Uh, is, do you bring up snapshots, or can you just give us a bit more insight on the DSP rollback process? Sure. And I didn't show you an architecture slide, which often helps in this circumstance. But the difference between DSP and other products is that we have a patented process where we have an agent that sits on a domain controller and it taps into the Active Directory replication stream. So, you know, because AD is a distributed application, every domain controller has the ability to make changes. And then what it does is other domain controllers ask all of the other domain controllers, have, do you have any updates? Give me your updates. And that's how domain controllers keep track with what all the other DCs are doing in the environment. So what a DSP agent does is it acts like a read-only domain controller and it asks the domain controller that it's sitting on, hey, do you have any changes? Hey, do you have any changes? You know, every, every few seconds. So it's tapped into the, and it uses the actual get NC changes API that domain controllers use to get Active Directory changes. So if an attacker is in the network and they make any changes to Active Directory, we see it. Because if we didn't see it, it didn't happen. That's the authoritative stream of what happened. And it can't be covered up because it is the actual, it is the actual record of changes to Active Directory. You can't erase that like you can erase event logs. We also track the event logs because the, this Active Directory replication stream tells us what has changed in AD, but the stream doesn't contain information of who made those changes. So what DSP does is it collects what has changed in Active Directory from that replication stream. And then it, it, it taps into the security event log to find out who made the changes. And it correlates the two and displays that on that console that I showed you there. So it shows you in a real-time basis what was changed and who made the changes. And with a simple checkbox, you can undo it. So in the case of DC Shadow, for example, DC Shadow is a domain persistence attack. So if a bad guy gets domain administrator rights, they don't want to sit in the domain admins group because that's where everybody looks. What they will do is execute a DC Shadow attack, which allows them to inject an arbitrary change into AD that is not logged anywhere. So typically what they will do is they will take um, the security identifier of, let's say, of an administrative group, let's say the domain administrators group, and they'll inject that into a normal user's user account. So the normal user does not show up in the domain administrator group, but they have domain administrator rights. The sneakiness of the DC shadow attack is that that attack is injected into AD, but there's no record of whoever made that change. I won't go into the details of how that happens, but it doesn't show up in the security event log. But because we monitor the Active Directory replication stream, we see not only the footprint of that attack, we see the back door that they've inserted and you can roll it back by just checking on a checkbox and saying undo. I suppose the real added value there um, on top of that is, if you don't have Sampras and something has happened, well, you know whether an OU has been deleted or a password has been reset or whatever the 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 malicious piece of software did, um, when you discover it, you have to recreate it. So you have to go through that process of finding out, okay, what's gone? Let's recreate it. But with Sampras, it's just undo. So it's right. it's instant as well. Like so, yeah, okay. Right. Well, and you you also bring out another interesting aspect of it, which is because we have a track of all of the changes that have been made in Active Directory, we find that a user has been doing something unusual. Maybe they've done a DC shadow attack, or maybe they've deleted an OU, or they've done something else that is suspicious. You can go back for six, eight months. We have companies that keep, keep this for more than a year, and you can do an exhaustive search for every change that particular user has made in Active Directory. 
and comb through it, export it as a CSV file or an HTML file and do a forensic analysis, that very last stage of the NIST framework I showed you, do a forensic analysis on everything that that person has done. Maybe that account has made a change six months ago that you weren't aware of. You can still go and roll it back again. Just check the checkbox and say, undo it. Excellent. Very good. So look, we're getting close to the hour now. Um, I think we've covered everything we wanted to cover today. Um, for everyone attending, you can see Sean's details are there if anyone wants to get in touch. I hope that's okay, Sean. And, yeah, uh, my, obviously, my colleague oh, yes, Dan Bowery there as well. Yes, and Dan as well, obviously. And look, at I will be sending out, uh, we've we recorded this session. So I'm going to send out to record the session. If anybody wants any follow-up, uh, they'll reach out to myself, reach out to Dan uh, and Sean as well. And I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. And for Dan, Neve, uh, Anna, and obviously Sean as well in Sampras. Well, thank you, Ronan. I appreciate the time. And uh, thanks, everybody, for taking, I'm sure, a very, very busy, uh, very busy hour out of your day.